where we gather to celebrate the power of art and storytelling in confronting the urgent challenges of our times. Founded in 1984, Ulite Arts plays a pivotal role in nurturing and supporting the local artistic community, empowering artists to explore, innovate, and create impactful work. The organization is dedicated to supporting visual artists and filmmakers and enriching the cultural landscape of the region. Today, I have the privilege of introducing three extraordinary short films commissioned by Ulight Arts and the city of Miami Beach, each offering a unique perspective on the climate crisis. First, we present Mango Movie by Jamie K. Gershen. <laughs> Mango Movie is a short documentary that explores the profound connection between Miami's beloved mango season and the ever-changing climate. Next, we have Ripples by Joshua Jean Baptiste. In this gripping narrative, we follow Luz, a passionate environmental researcher, as she uncovers a looming threat to her community. And finally, we present Before the Flood by Leanne Russell. a portrait of a man reflecting on his youth. This film offers a haunting glimpse into a world on a brink of irreversible change. As we embark on this cinematic journey, let us heed the call to action embed within each frame, and let us strive to create a more sustainable and equitable world for all of us. Welcome to the Aspen Ideas Climate Screening. Together, we can harness the power of storytelling to shape a brighter future. Thank you. Oh no, what's going on in this? Woo, this one ain't pitting. Oh well, this is good for the takes. Mm, mm, mm. That's a good mango. Yes, yes. Mm. 
anywhere in the mango. Anywhere in it. Mm. I love mango. The texture, the taste, the juice. Lo sientes así como rico. <laughs> and what I love about it is very nutritious. Вот для меня чувство очень сладко. You eat a mango every day. That's the only way to survive a Miami summer. I moved to South Florida and began to understand the pleasure of mango in season. You know, you're not from Miami if you don't like a mango. You know what I'm saying? Salt on? Yeah. Up. Good dog. Good dog. <laughs> when mango season comes, we're at each other's houses. We're tasting the different mangoes. You feel me? Most fruits, it's just, they maybe have a few variety, but mango have a lot of varieties. When I was a kid, we used to go mango picking. It's more now than it was back then. A lot of people have mango trees. I, I even got some in my yard now. <laughs> I give them to my neighbors, I eat them. People make mango pie, mango flan, mango, I make mango jam. People will, like jump over your fence and take your mangoes. It's just something, that nostalgia that you have when you were like a kid and you know, like, oh, yo, we got mangoes, let's do this, yo. Oh, I've been loving mangoes since I've been knowing myself. Eating a mango, for me, it can, it can be an experience of self-love. It feels like, you know, you're a pirate and you're just looking for treasure and uh, it and the payoff is just, I mean, at Paladar, the mango is like, <laughs> and my relationship to mangoes comes from like just my relationship to my grandma. She has a big mango tree in her backyard, and so it's just kind of like part of my upbringing. Oh, I've had this mango connection since I was five years old, as far as I can remember. I fell in love with just climbing trees, and then the reward of climbing a tree and picking a mango and eating it on the tree it was just like one of the most amazing adventures for me as a child. Um. I cannot pick them because I'm too little. Mi padre tiene una manera muy particular de comer mango. Entonces siento que esa forma de comer su mango quedó arraigada en mí. Grand mangue me mange mango. Les chits à la foule où elle prend plaisir, les râles couteaux, les cambes de couteaux dans la main. The Kali mango, the Kali mango, a tout plaisir. The fil se coupe et bon mango. Et puis les coupons l'autre six mois encore. Les mettez dans bouche les pour la la lire même mango bon 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 dans bouche les. So I guess I take a little bit after her because I love mangoes so much. You know the skin also typically in most fruits and veggies has the most nutrients. That's at least what my grandma told me. <laughs> so I believe her. <laughs> mm. Mm. We don't, I don't have much inhibition when I eat a mango, you know, juice be coming down and, <laughs> you know, you just get into it. My mom was like such a clean freak, like she was like, and she didn't like the sound of like, 
So she was always like, always like, you know, a Hawkeye, like if how, you know, how messy you were. Recently, I discovered a technique that's kind of perfect for me and maximizes how much mango meat. I put it on the, on the top. Lo pico como en pedacitos, como en cuadritos. I usually use the skin and just start tearing into it. Con los dientes, con el machete, con el cuchillo, con lo que haya la mano. I kind of like the connection with like hands and mango. Some people beat it. I don't touch the mango skin because I'm allergic to it. So I ask people to cut the mango for me and then I eat the pieces. The way I first did it was I cut it in half and I didn't know that there was a seed in the inside. And then my whole family had to pitch in and tell me this is the way to do it, this is the way to do it. But I found my own way, just by trial and error, honestly. There is no right way to eat a mango. You eat a mango like your heart tells you to eat that mango. At first, there were just tiny specks on the branches. With time and rain and the wind and God, they grew and grew. These were her first bloom, birthed after the South Florida winter. Our tree, she stretched and groaned. I would sit underneath her shade and listen as these little mangoes fell from her branches. She stretched and groaned and swayed. What fell to the ground then belonged to the ants, the blue jays, and the red cardinals, the squirrels, family of raccoons, and one red-haired sly fox who paid us a visit every now and again. She first fed them. How lovely, I thought. How generous. That's yummy. As the last of these mangoes fell, overnight it seemed, new ones took their place. These were different. When they got to the size of the first bloom, instead of falling, they grew bigger and bigger and bigger. There were so many, so big and so many, that in amazement I wondered how she had the strength to keep hold of them all. Slowly, as the weeks passed, I watched them transition from green to yellow, and finally to red. This tree who first fed them now okay. fed us, our friends, our parents, our neighbors, and perfect strangers. It gave an abundance unconditionally and without hesitation. Ooh. As I cut open that first perfect mango and its nectar released, my fingers become sweet and sticky, bright orange inside, its flesh, Thick, heavy, and sexy. You can't eat a mango neatly. You must bite into it wide with all your being and allow it to drip down your chin as you close your eyes and sigh. That sigh is a prayer. That sigh is gratitude. climate change in one direction. It's climate chaos. We have a much less predictable seasonality. We've seen seasons with huge floods, near freezing temperatures, and now, you know, we're seeing one of the hottest summers yet. It's been a great year for mangoes this year, but who knows next year what'll be different.
my name is Nicholas Bonet. I was born in Miami, Florida. My parents are Cuban. They immigrated in the 60s. <laughs> are you playing with me? Tell me, what's your name? Celeste. Okay, I'm Celeste. It's Celeste, too. I like that it's sweet, so I'm going to eat it. And I'm going to pick it on the sides. And I'm going to pick it in quadrants. And then I'm going to put it in. Mmm. Mmm. Religion's got it wrong. I don't think the fruit was an apple. I think it was a mango all along. <laughs> the one fruit you can't say no to. Lose. Now, these meetings, they can be tricky. What's so tricky about their project flooding neighborhoods? Politics, business, and science require tact. Keep that in mind. <laughs> you know, of all my students, you were the brightest. And that's why I feel you can handle these meetings. You get to see the research in action. <laughs> that means a lot. I'm like a sexy science dynamic duo. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I'll take it. <laughs> hey, um, in the updated report, you left out my analysis on their other projects, like in Sweetwater. They were good projections, but the focus must remain on this case. Expanding our scope right now, that could dilute our argument, okay? Just feels like we're ignoring the larger issue. What is up, Doc? Oh, Raffi. <laughs> How are you? How are you? Good, good. How's the university? Oh, you like good. the job I got? I am loving it. Can't good. complain. Numbers good. are good. <laughs> Our analysis confirms the main structures not only meet, but in several aspects exceed the safety That's standard. That's excellent, Dr. Barrett. However, this level of safety incurs significant costs, as detailed in the reports. Luce, can you? Okay, now, it is crucial for us to consider the environmental impact. So I prepared some graphs, and it's going to outline exactly what, what we're dealing what, with. But why I does this take include data from, from other projects? Um, I can explain. Your projects, they consistently seem to encroach and degrade natural barriers, like tree lines and wetlands that protect vulnerable areas. This says 15 years from now. <laughs> it's about long-term sustainability. Thank you for your insight, Dr. Barrett. Um, some of it will be useful for a board's review. Uh, don't you need all of it for city council? Why? City Council's decision's already in. Project's approved. Your report is more about demonstrating our um, due diligence. So focus on wrapping up the presentation for the board. I'll see you Thursday. Oh, um, just you. What happened? The blue folder did not include all the other projects. Luce, that's not your call. But I needed to say something. Listen, I understand you are driven. But idealism without pragmatism is just noise. Now out with it. What was that? My mom's church. Sweetwater. It's a staple in the neighborhood. It's not gonna last. I just wanted to do my part. Loose, bold actions have their place, but so does strategic thinking. And while we strategize what? The neighborhood becomes a waterfront? Is that our incremental step? 
You can't help anyone by throwing away our credibility. Credibility? They're basically paying you for approval. So when we play by their rules, we lose what matters most. Go home. We'll regroup later this week. Studio's closed. No more classes. Hi, Terrence. I'm Luz Guerrero, assistant environmental researcher. I saw you at Rafi's office today. Uh, yeah, what's up? Remember this? My hand is losing its soul to concrete. See, they pushing us to the edge. And the only way to hang on is to fight back. A report we're working on is being buried by the developers you're working with. It's about serious flood risks, <laughs> risks that can harm many. Come on, what's my work gonna do now? Your voice. Your art. The community respects you. If you speak up, we I can change this. I have a daughter to think about. I literally can't afford to be the voice of dissent anymore. I don't know. It's giving sellout. I'm gonna stop you right there. See, Miami's changing. Artists like me, we're feeling the squeeze. It's a push, a battle for space and recognition in the city for getting its own. It's win or lose. I'm gonna tell you this, I'm not about to lose. Look, I Yo, I ain't no hero, all right? I go on clear. That's who we need right now. So we have Dr. Barrett and the legendary, legendary Terrence P. And that's how we're ensuring that this project is, is not just a development, but a a true community collaboration. <laughs> Daryl, get it, show them what we've got. Wow, I am glad to be a part of this. See, I've been in the game for a very long time and to contribute my work to something at this scale is Chef's kiss. <laughs> uh, Dr. Barrett, why, why don't you tell him about the environmental stuff you've been working on? Yeah, um, uh, the, um, the environmental uh, assessments, they meet all of the standards. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. You see, with her research, we've, we were able to clear the hurdle of city council, of city council approving this whole thing. Green is in, baby. But looking beyond, the future is determined by our actions today. You have to look at all of your investments like a game of dominoes. If you can't meet the needs of the neighborhood, don't put the tile down. In this case, a condo. Now is the time to consider an integrated bottom line, balancing economic growth, environmental, and social responsibility. I spent years measuring the impact of development. I see what happens when the scales tip too far. Uh, this is, All this of is... us have a role in this community. Build or destroy. It's pretty binary. I'm not saying this as a scientist, but as someone from the city, I have seen the best and the worst of what happens when we make decisions like this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barry. It's not enough. It's not enough to say we didn't know. Dare to envision a city that holds space for all its people, respects the natural sanctuaries, and thrives off the diversity of its voices. That's the hey, kind of Dr. community. Barry, we've got to move on, but uh, she's thank right you for your research. Sir. You know what? Let me show y'all what I'm really doing. Hey, yo, Daryl, 
Click the photo on my next drive. Daryl. Daryl, Daryl, don't you dare do that. Daryl, Daryl, don't you dare do that. Luxury condos and mega malls that cater to the one percent, while they displace the real Miami. Good morning. Sorry, I will. No, it's okay. Sit. Good morning. I owe you an apology. For what? For not listening sooner. Your fire is important, more than I realized. Making people care requires that energy. I take it the meeting went well? They let me go. Duh, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Good news. They're gonna evaluate all of their development projects just like you suggested. And I met an investor there, they like what we're doing, and he wants to work with us to review their entire portfolio. That's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Wait, so we're still working with the developers, huh? Yeah, why? Um, I was a little pissed about the whole church thing. I'm sorry. For? Is your neighborhood affected? I posted this and Watch the next video it kind of went viral. I have the data that outlines all of the terrible practices that these companies do. Cover them out and make some noise. Lose? Hoy vamos a perrear como se debe. Escúchate este ritmo pa que te pegue. Hoy vamos a perrear como se debe. Party pa abajo, se entra dentro, baby, hoy se bebe. Todas las bitches gírense, mami, voy se breve. Torqueate bien, ponte el cuatro si se atreve. Matorqueate bien, matorqueate bien, matorqueate bien, matorqueate bien. Ponte salvaje y travesita, travesita. Ponte salvaje y travesita, travesita. Corre el travesito. Zot di, san rete san, poussière rete poussière. Mais moi même, moi j'ai toujours connu ma bretonne dans la mer. Grand océanus. Tant, tant qu'on file, n'a pas toujours platonné. Il va bien commencement, il va bien finir. Parfois ça trop et me baga kembe. C'est la vie. C'est ça que je dis tête moi pour me réussir. Faut que je devienne sous la mer pour me joindre ma paix d'esprit. Quand il y a la mer entourée nous, et c'est seul ça qui est dans l'esprit. Je pense à jouer en vain inondation. La nati toujours joue nos façons pour écrire ça pour lui. Des fonds plans pour me quitter tout ça là. Des sentiers ça que t'as pas arrivé à. Et me pas le verre là pour ça. Bah qu'on qui côté me d'avoir aller. Même dès qu'on aime d'avoir joué nos côtés. Et me joue lui. Jeune garçon. Je ne garçon pas trop posé par ça. Pourtant, il y a des fait bien. Je commencé à pigeon mieux. L'homme a commencé à entraîner. Il était trop jeune. Ça fait un peu Béatrice. Puis j'aime qui voyage et puis bien. Béatrice, maman. Yo. Mais oui, tant que Béatrice. Non, maman, tout. 
Mary. Je dis pigeon par mes volets sous la main. Eh bien, oui. Eh bien, pigeon par mes volets. Yo, jam. Bah, on comment yo fait. Mais yo volé tout côté et yo continue à voler. Ça y est, déjà. Je voulais qu'on ait ça, qu'on ait. Zélio. Plémio. Gardez. Bon Dieu, je fais ces oiseaux, mais avec des mains. Chachetez. Vous connaissez qui côté bio joint moi. Vous toujours joint moi. Thank you so much for these beautiful works, for these beautiful uh, short films. Uh, and I'm going to start by asking Jamie something. Jamie, Mango Movie. <laughs> I remember when I reached out to you to uh, invite you to be part of this uh, commission, 
that you uh, told me, I want to do a film of people eating mangoes, like right away. <laughs> what was, like, how? How do you know you want to make a, a film of people eating mango? And what, 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 what did you learn during the process of making the film? Man, um, well, one, you should always have a roster of ideas as a filmmaker. <laughs> um, two, I've been in Miami. I'm not from here, but I've spent my whole adult life here. And mango season is such a pivotal part of our culture. Yes. And I just, I always wanted to make a movie about how people eat mangoes. And when, I don't know, it just clicked when you called. I was like, oh my god, the mango movie is a climate movie. And uh, I, I just, I kind of got to, I wasn't sure exactly how, but I really came to this understanding that um, if you could reflect on a thing that you love mm -hmm. before it's gone, maybe it would change the way you consider how you move forward. It was very interesting because it was not just people eating mango, but, but then you see like, what, what did you learn during the process of making the film? Um, I heard some of you learn this too, that woman who like cut it in half and then twisted it and, yes. and pull, pulled the seed out. I think all of us were like, what? <laughs> um, I did learn that the reason I'm allergic to mango skin is because it's, a, it's in the poison ivy family. Ooh. And my mom is like immensely allergic to poison ivy, so. I learned that everybody's grandmother taught them something special about mangoes. Mm, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I grew up in Massachusetts and we didn't have mangoes, but when I showed my mom, she was like, well, this just reminds me of how I used to eat oranges with my mom or potatoes. Like they, what I found was that in watching the mango movie, people connected to whatever made them feel nostalgic in their own lives. Yeah. Joshua. Yes. Your turn. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, Ripples. Yes. We got Loose. Uh huh. It's a narrative film. Mm -hmm. What do you think narrative films can bring to the table when talking about climate change and, and environmental issues? Uh, I am a firm believer in the, one of the strongest natural resources we have on Earth in our society, the power of coolness. I think that coolness has been monopolized by brands and fashion and whatnot. And I remember a golden era in the 90s where science stuff was super cool. And I think it still is. So to answer your question, I think narrative shorts, uh, narrative films, narrative content like L Ripples um, can be done in a way where climate content can be really compelling and relatable. I feel like the facts and figures are very overwhelming to the average person. Obviously, this room, that's all y'all probably deal with. But you know, the average Joe can probably feel very overwhelmed by it and might check out. But you know, the idea kind of hit me where I'm like, well, what if I created a story and you know, ideally a TV show in which we follow true to life characters that people can see themselves in and kind of like Trojan horse in some climate stuff, but just kind of getting them in the gate and uh, you know, relating to it in a way. And hopefully I feel like, especially with a story like Ripples that takes place in Miami, um, people can see themselves and be like, well, gosh, I do remember you know, my neighborhood not flooding last year. And uh, you know, ideally that'll make people a little more conscious about what's going on. Nice, you mentioned a, t a show? Yes, yeah, so Ripples is ideally, it is, it is a TV show that I want to create and produce here. Um, I really feel like there's a, a big market for climate content kind of in that realm. And honestly, like you look at CSI, you look at Grey's Anatomy, Law and Order, there's all these shows about law and, 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 and health stuff, but I've never seen a show about scientists, ever. And I'm like, I mean, and if you know one, please let me know, but like a compelling drama that's like sexy and, and, and compelling and fun, like, you know, scientists and people that work in this space have lives too, and I, I feel like there's a gap that, it need, that could be bridged, and I feel like there's a rife with opportunity there. So I, I would hope to see this evolve as a TV show. Let's make that happen. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Lian, before the flood. So it's a, a story with pigeons, the sea, the ocean, Miami. What inspired you to tell this story? 
Um, there were a few different elements. Uh, as a native Miamian, I've seen how our water level just keeps rising, and I think it was born out of this climate anxiety that I think a lot of us have here of just this imminent flood. Um, so this uh, Before the Flood is a character portrait of a character in a film that I'm working on called Madre Mares um, that takes place in over, I never say Miami in it, but over a flooded Miami and it. It's a, a grounded sci-fi that sort of subverts the tropes of the genre. It takes place in, under a bright, hot, uh, oppressive sun and a bright blue sky uh, on two boats in the middle of nowhere. And there's this man that is looking for land uh, with pigeons that he's attached cameras to. So this was sort of a, a peek into his world. Um, I'm working with an actor who's, uh, who did the voiceover. Actually, it, uh, it wasn't the actor that is in the film. It's not his voice. Uh, it's the older man reflecting upon his youth and how he started preparing for this flood. And um, the actor was asking me different uh, character questions. And usually as a writer, I, I, you know, I, when I write something and I give the actor the script, I, I hand it over and I give them ownership. But I thought it was interesting, some of the questions that he was asking. And so I started delving a little bit more into the backstory um, of this character and um, a little peek into his world. Um, there's a quote also that I, I brought that really inspired uh, not only this, but uh, Mater Mares. Um, it's a Rachel Carson quote from 1960 that I found really beautiful. Uh, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is to life itself. Mm. And I feel like we're still up against, it's just a constant, uh, <laughs> never-ending yeah. uh, struggle. Uh, so, real quick, one thing you want people, the audience, to take out of your films? Uh, trust Gen Z. Please do. Oh, they I are the future. We are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie? Man, I hope you really want a mango, because the season's coming. Um, don't underestimate pigeons. <laughs> they might save us. Thank you so much. I really want to thank you uh, again for your films. I really want to see the TV show of Ripples. I would love to see that. I want to see uh, your film, uh, Lian, as well. And Jamie, I want to see your film playing at, at a lot of festivals and uh, just out there so people can uh, connect with these stories that you're bringing. So thank you again so much. Thank you for enjoying this uh, segment. And let's continue with the Aspen Ideas Climate. Hi. At a bustling international airport recently, I witnessed a small child, maybe three or four years old, atop the shoulders of a very tall father, affording the child a bird's eye view of the airport's bright colors and vibrant human activity. But instead of seeing the child, delighted and filled with curiosity, I couldn't see anything because he was looking down into a device nestled atop his father's head, buried in his father's hair, oblivious to the world around him. Indeed, the human experience going on around him was just flying by his head. But what a paradox to see the kids in this film that you're about to see, a very short film, but a very impactful film, the kids who are paying attention and who are generally worried sick. In a way, this film isn't really fair to show to an audience like this because we all know what they're about to tell us. And it's sobering, but it's a good kind of wrap up to the past three days, I think. This film is called The Important Stuff, and it's made by Laius Flori, a Brazilian woman, and her team in Brazil. And there's six, in fact, made that were made for COP28. And it allows the kids in their own voices <clears throat> to exhort us to do better and accelerate shifting, changing, mitigating, and pivoting from a world of war and pollution and heat and fire and floods 
to one which offers them a stable future where all can thrive. It showcases kids why should have a seat at the table and indeed determine their own priorities and have child rights. My name is Kim Larson, and I'm here on behalf as a board member of the Children in Nature Network, which is one of the sponsors of this film. Our mission at the Children in Nature Network is to focus and expedite our strategic initiative called Nature Everywhere Kids Live and Learn and Play to address the consequences of device addiction to climate change challenges. <clears throat> Excuse me, we know kids are less connected to nature than ever before, and we know kids in nature, all humans, are inextricably linked and affected by nature deprivation. We thrive as nature thrives. Thus, human physical and mental well-being and equitable access to the outdoors and wild places are our goals at Children in Nature Network. Indeed, saving, celebrating, protecting nature mirrors our own security as a species. And seriously, as a mom, I often say, what other species sullies its own nest? I don't know. <clears throat> I invite you and urge you to check out our website, childreninnature.org, uh, which was founded 20 years ago by Richard Louvre, who is the author of the book, Last Child in the Woods. Um, I will end with this quote in this book that I just started reading that I really love, called A Brief History of Earth. And if you're like me, feeling always feeling short of time, you'll love this subtitle, which is called Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters. <clears throat> and it reads as such. Has the world run amok? In a word, yes. Why do so many people care so little in the face of planetary change that will shape the lives of our children and grandchildren? In 1968, Baba Dium, a Senegalese forest ranger, provided a memorable answer, and we've all heard versions of this before. In the end, he said, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And I would add what we see, what we feel, what we hear. Um, here's the film, and I will only leave you with one last thought, which is when I hear that horrible term MAGA, all I can think of is make America green again. Thank you. I've heard about it only once, but I'm not really sure what they do. Control climate change. It's a lot more hot. Então quem manda aqui na frente da minha casa, bem aqui. I bet all they do is fight about, I think we should do this, no, I think we should do that. No, I actually think we should do this. If we continue queimando, a gente vai morrer nesse calor. If a pizza que se caiet no tenen que se sair naquela carambola e tu sei de meto fumeca ou sair na tica. Stop fighting for once and let's focus on the important stuff. E how no octar shwaye? طبعا لو ما اتخذنا اجراءات لتغيير المناخ راح ندفع الثمن في المستقبل. Well, no offense, but you guys only have a few years left to live. And meanwhile, I'm 11. I, I have my whole life to live and I want to live it. Adultos, se você então lembrando, você tem que cuidar das crianças. وأننا نحن لازم نحافظ على بيئتنا لأن هذا كوكبنا نحن. Stop talking about and actually do it. 
Klimatske promjene su mnogo moj život upropastile, moglo bi se reći. I have the privilege and honor to be the producer and director of the next film you're about to see, Climate Blueprint, Dominica, which is about the ambition of this Caribbean island to be the most resilient nation in the world. And this story really is about what does it look like when you have a whole of society and whole of government plan for resilience that is target-based and has a timeline of 2030. So we uh, started this series as a series on small island developing states and how they are leading on climate action globally. Um, so this film is gonna be uh, the very first one and we'll go from here to Vanuatu uh, telling the story of uh, the case that's coming in front of the criminal, uh, International Criminal Justice Court and the advisory opinion and then we'll go from there to Barbados to do a story on the Bridgetown Initiative. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context of what you're gonna get to see. Um, this film, from when it was first conceived to when it was premiered at COP, was one year. So we are trying to raise the ambition and timeline for climate storytelling, because we need to move a lot faster than the average film timeline, which is seven years. Uh, so that's, that's part of the vision with these stories, but they're also meant to be really impactful in terms of the audience that they're reaching. So we went to COP, and what's coming up next is going to the World Bank uh, spring meetings. Um, you'll see in this story that one of the big pieces about is about the loss and damage fund. Um, and making sure that it gets funded and that it gets funded a lot more than it currently is funded and that that money is deployed quickly and without as much capacity as it typically takes to deploy this capital to where it needs to go. So you'll see this uh, as a theme inside the story, but it also is really about the people and the place that this is taking, that this is happening. So enjoy Climate Blueprint. I come to you straight from the front line of the war on climate change. With physical and emotional difficulty, I have left my bleeding nation to be with you here today because these are the moments for which the United Nations exist. We as a country and as a region did not start this war against nature. We did not provoke it. The war has come to us. We are in shock, but we will rise because Dominican people are strong, because Caribbean people are resilient. Maria is the worst I've ever seen. It's something not to forget. We were in town that morning, and then we heard there was this storm coming in. Everybody went shopping and make sure we have drinking water, you know, food to sustain that hurricane. Making sure we have everything inside, putting our animals and make sure everything is stable. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock, the hurricane arrived in our area. We heard a whistling song. I was in my basement and I was hearing like trees falling, the houses were all flying away. Like there was this do 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 the ground, it shook like an earthquake. Next morning, my God, no houses. All the houses were gone. At one point in time, I said to myself, what are we going to do? When a hurricane hits a country like Dominica, it affects the entire country. How does a country like Dominica recover from that? And how does a country like Dominica respond? There's no blueprint that we could pick up and follow for a resilient nation. 
So we had to create for ourselves our vision of resiliency. This is us trying to come to a solution for ourselves and looked at what are the key areas that we need to be focusing on. Building strong communities, a robust economy, a well-planned and durable infrastructure, collective consciousness, sustainably leveraged natural resources and institutionalizing resilience. When the vision was expressed to make us a climate resilient country, I think there was a buy-in by the whole population with, yes, we need to be doing this. Dominica set out to become the world's first climate resilient nation. That is incredibly ambitious, but the ambition is important. It sets a goal. It's an example of a country that's fighting back. Dominica is not unique in trying to formulate a plan and implement a plan to address these issues. All small island developing states around the world are taking this seriously because they have to. Dominica may be further along in really articulating the vision and setting really clear targets and like developing indicators to measure progress on the things that the country is committed to doing. The whole world is going to have to do this. The sense of small islands as being the canary in the coal mine, they're the first to experience what everybody else is going to have to deal with. None of this can happen overnight. There is no silver bullet. There's no quick fix to dealing with climate change in the tropics. But they're definitely moving in the right direction. We are the nature island in the Caribbean. We have lots of rivers, mountains, valleys. Dominica is beautiful, Dominica is good. <laughs> There's a word to describe it. Dominican people, they are hardworking. We help each other, we go the extra mile. The people are involved in that community. Everybody in Dominica is friendly. Very loving people. The people are resilient. We are able to bounce back quickly. About 500 years ago, we the Talinago people lived in the entire Caribbean. All that changed when Columbus came into the Caribbean. With colonization, things changed completely, particularly when the British took over Dominica. Sugar was a big product of the day. Every European power wanted a sugar island. Britain had got this one. And so it was surveyed and subdivided for sugar. After emancipation, enslaved people who had formerly lived on the plantations were told basically that if you don't continue to work for us, you've got to get off. So what happened in the East was that along the plantation boundaries, you found the rugged land that the plantation didn't need. And so the people who had previously been living on the plantations then moved to these rugged areas. So you have villages which are seriously affected today because they are sitting on areas which are very volatile when it comes to rainstorms. Without being deterministic about history, you can trace all of these things back to decisions and actions that happened a very long time ago. During the colonial period, the assumption was that it would be the local plantation owners that would invest in infrastructure, and they didn't. of the work that Creed has been doing is looking at how we can institutionalize resilience, ensuring that government's agenda is 
fully aligned with the Climate Resilience Plan so that you have a country that can better weather climate-related disasters and other disasters and be able to, to bounce back or bounce forward much better. That kind of mainstreaming resilience across governments was really a critical component of what Creed was set up to do to really get the sort of resilience thinking and awareness of climate change and hazards into the psyche of the people and of the government. And they're going to need to make sure that everything they do is measured and link it back to, to projects, that there's really understanding of resilience, what it means, how to measure progress on it, and supporting government as well in understanding better what they're doing to contribute to the resilience goal of the country. It can't be just like one agency or one government department or one initiative that addresses all of that because it's about everything. It's about agriculture, it's about housing, it's about roads, and in Dominica, critically, bridges, where things are located in relation to slopes, in relation to rivers, in relation to the sea. It's about education and people growing up, understanding that and wanting to kind of participate in this kind of transformational vision. You can see that it really involves sort of everybody. The Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan, uh, there's 20 targets that Dominica wants to achieve by 2030. One of the most critical ones refers to the ability of communities to be self-reliant after an extreme weather event. The target is for 14 days. So if you think about what that implies and what's needed in a community for it to be able to self-subsist for 14 days after a hurricane, that's quite a number of things. It's how can government and businesses and through supply chains, how can we ensure that communities are set up to deal with these things on their own? We did trainings with the Office of Disaster Management. We have teams that we call a CERT. So it's Community Emergency Response Team. We do simulations in case that happen, how we're going to respond. It's about letting people take ownership of where they are and teach people to trust each other and to trust the process. A strong community is the backbone of resilience. And if your communities are strong and are prepared, then you can recover much more quickly. Cooperative action is very relevant because a disaster happens, you're cut off from the rest of the island. It usually is extremely difficult for government services to reach you. There's a lot of cooperation. So much so that there's a type of cooperation called um, coup de main in the Creole, which means a helping hand. After Maria, there is this one community called Wainika. Four days after the hurricane, all of these individuals within that community were back in their homes because they were carpenters, they were plumbers, they were electricians that help. Anything that has to be done, we would reach out to each other. When the French settlers arrived, they transformed the indigenous houses into more European-style oblong houses with roofs and windows and all that kind of stuff. But they maintained some of the qualities of the indigenous. And they were extremely resilient hurricanes. Not only was it a matter of the design of the house, but also the placement of the house. Many, a number of them, have been there for 200 and something, 250 years, and they've withstood hurricanes for that length of time. But then in the 1950s, we sacrificed all of that. There was this fixation about copying the United States. We brought in a whole set of imported stuff, prefabricated glass windows. There were never glass windows before. You need houses that are well ventilated, 
that adapt to the northeast trade winds that constantly come from the east. And yet at the same time, within a short period of time, I'm talking about minutes, can be shut up and be secure. This is the classic Dominica Tikai. You have got a bonnet roof, or what they call a half hip. Across there, you peg it all in. It holds that end of the roof together. It prevents the roof from being ripped off. A flat roof takes off more quickly and easily than if you have a steeper roof, which is well braced and framed, you know? So all of these elements are important when you're considering resilience. Climate change is real, eh? We're experiencing it every year. We have been exposed to some element, whether it's um, intense rainfall, hurricanes, a flooding, and drought. We cannot keep going back to ground zero. Starting all over every time a storm like Maria or Erica happens. We have seen intense rain in a short period with a lot of water. The soil that we have can absorb a lot of that water and that can itself cause a lot of land slippage. Our number one plan to try to stop it would be to control the underlying water water that you don't see. Like make provision that when it rains, that it would follow a system of drains. The water catchment would lead straight towards the sea so it doesn't affect any of the soil around it. The other option would be to implement our vectiver systems where we use for soil stabilization. So if you notice on this plot of land, the farmer has a step drain that will reduce the speed at which the water will run off the, the slope, as well as the, there are some counter drains to cut back on the water that will be going down the slope. So there are so many things that you would put in place, and that's to do with the intense rain. We have to go back to what we used to do before, because in the past, farmers used green solutions as part of their sustainable practice on their farm. We are brilliant minds, <laughs> and we have some good people, you know, behind these said projects. So I believe if we put our mind to it, and you know, we actually challenge, we challenge it back. It's about having a strong economy and high-end exports. It produces bay oil and other essential oils, which can sell for higher prices. So you've got to get organized and kind of invest in that agro-processing. It's not just about diversification, it's about specialization. We all get together, we can create more honey, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a great point. <laughs> <laughs>
but strong people, strong children, strong homes, all of that matter. So resilience is let every day be better than the day before because something yesterday made you stronger for today. Learning through your tribulations so that you might be a strength to somebody who might go through something similar. And if you could make it, I can make it too. So walk with me for a little while. That's it, not just for yourself, but for others. What I do remember is the beauty of the reefs. In the 50s, we adopted the banana industry. All the banana fields had to be sprayed. That was a massive amount of chemical poison that was poured into the island. That all then flowed down onto these reefs. And now the reefs are dead. That caused a serious issue because then the reefs were not able to protect the island coast against the storm surge. When you go down to the southern end of the island, in the area where there's a Soufraya Marine Reserve, that did not have the banana industry. And the reefs down there are pretty healthy. Here at Nature Island Diving, we've sort of changed our business model a little bit where our dive masters are actually utilizing that time that we have during dives with tourists to actually do a conservation project. A lot of these zones that we have set up here, these are all standard parts of the Sufrius Scots Head Marine Reserve. This is an area where we'd like to do an underwater statue park, also put a wreck and put more parking. The sort of idea is make Champagne an even bigger attraction area where people would have lots of different activities to do. What we've been doing is sort of cutting edge, especially where you're getting tourism to work with conservation. My hope for the future, it's not very grandiose. It's not trying to save the world, change anything massive like that. It's just, I hope that Super Air Scots at Galleon can reach the full potential that I believe this community has. Dominica has not sat back and said, you know, we're vulnerable, we're a victim. We have developed a solution for ourselves. If Dominica can show that it is a good example for others to follow so that all of us can become more resilient, all of us can reduce the impact of these disasters on our countries. There are opportunities available for the world to participate in the transformational vision of a small country seeking to become a climate resilient country. And one is in relation to the accessibility of climate finance. It's very difficult for small states to access because the, the, the procedures that are in place are quite onerous and take a lot of time. All of the targets have all been generated here in Dominica. It wasn't written by external consultants. So for donors and for development partners, this should be seen as an opportunity somewhere where they can support that vision because it already exists. It's really a partnership. This is not a question of charity. There is a real moral and economic imperative. All of the benefits that the UK reaped from industrializing, developing, extracting natural resources from countries like Dominica, have in some way contributed to climate change. There's a kind of double responsibility for helping to support Dominica in its resilience journey. These are questions of climate justice. The message is we're already doing a lot and people are investing their own resources in building resilience. And that needs to be supported. There's enough kind of collective knowledge of what needs to be done to get on with it.
the time has come for the international community to make a stand and to decide whether it will be shoulder to shoulder with those suffering the ravages of climate change worldwide or whether the international community will merely show some pity now and then flee, relieved to know that this time it was not you. Above all else, Mr. President and members of this August body, we need you. We need your humanity and we need you now to act truly as our United Nations.